we are live. We are live! <laughs> Hello world! <laughs> YouTube. Yes, on YouTube. <laughs> In my culture, we are taught to always remember your roots, but also to always respect and take care of the land that you presently live on. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the indigenous people present here today for sharing their land with us and to go home and thank their elders and ancestors for doing the same. We can't change the past, but we can learn from it and make a better future. I pray that we can all heal our past wounds and come together to make this land a peaceful and prosperous place as the ind indigenous ancestors had dreamed of making it. Thanks for that land uh, acknowledgement, Fatima. Um, you all, I think, will be seeing a lot more of Fatima in the future, which is great. Uh, she's been the the rock behind this project for thank you a number of years at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes, we're coming to you from the Centre Resurgo uh, in Moncton. I'm Jillian Dykeman. I'm your, the curator for Atlantic Vernacular. Um, the artists are each going to introduce themselves in just a moment, but I'll just take a moment to introduce our project. So Atlantic Vernacular was conceptualized in, I want to say, 2019, yeah, 2019 um, and has been through different iterations of imagining, and then finally we landed on um, an, a digital exhibition um, to accommodate all of the needs of the pandemic, as well as to continue to showcase and celebrate uh, the voice of Atlantic Canadian artists. Um, it's a unique exhibition where you can uh, view uh, contemporary craft of Atlantic Canada, and each piece of craft has been paired with uh, a regional poet uh, who's responded to the work. And um, if you go to atlanticvernacular.ca, you're able to listen to recitations of the poems by the poets themselves, um, which is a really wonderful way to spend more time both with the work um, and the poetry. So I certainly invite you to check that out if you haven't already, or spend more time with it. Um, and with that, I'm just going to give things over to Ali Murphy. Hey, Jill. Um, so hi, Ray. Thank you for being here in person and at home, uh, wherever you're tuning in for. Uh, from I just wanted to give a couple quick thank yous. So a quick thank you to Nandi for being our wonderful tech person and always saving us in that way, making things look professional. Um, Resurgo Place, as Jillian had mentioned, Sue Sinclair and Jenilyn Albert, who have really been the poetry contacts on this side of the project and helped us connect with the po poets that are involved in this. Rihanna Howard for doing the graphic design for this project, and then the wonderful staff at Craft MB. Fatima, and Emily, and Anne, who have all played a major part in making that all happen kind of behind the scenes and in our online shop and having the work available there as well, which is wonderful. A uh, quick thank you to the 30 artists and 29 poets who've been involved in this. There's been um, a lot of people who have worked and had their hands in this to make it a successful exhibition, which we're very excited to share with people. Um, and especially thank you to those who have been a part of the artist talks and shared their ideas and their craft and answered questions and kind of given us a little bit more insight in how the things have happened that way. And also a thank you to the province of New Brunswick and the Canada Council for the Arts for supporting this project. Um, without them, we would not have been able to do it at all, and it has allowed for money to, be else to also be circulated to the artists and the poets involved and the curator and everybody who's kind of been involved in this. So a uh, big thank you to those two governing bodies for, for supporting culture and craft and poetry. Oh, and then I was also going to turn the floor over to Matt for two seconds here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just be really quick. So I just want to thank uh, everyone for showing up today. Thank you to the Craft MB staff for putting this together. And we have a little gift here for Jillian. So thank oh. you, Jillian, <laughs> for our curating the show oh, and for being here today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Should I open it on the YouTube? Or of course. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank Let you the so, so much. Oh, it's the prints. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. Yeah, so everybody remember, you can buy these broadsides of the poems. Uh, oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited. Um, on, the, on the shop. Oh, beautiful. This is oh, nice. This is great. Oh, big Alpine. Okay. Very nice. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Heather. 
Touching moment. Um, I will <laughs> hand things along to the artists to introduce <coughs> themselves. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen LeBlanc. Uh, I'm a Weaver and Tiger artist and have been for a good many years, <laughs> especially since I started as a child. I really did. I, I, uh, <laughs> I started weaving on a backstrap loom in Hampton, um, where I was uh, growing up. Um, and uh, so Let's see, fast forward to being an adult, um, and, and uh, I was married, I had two little kids, and then my marriage split up, and I went back to school, sold everything, and, and went back to school, went to university. So I did a Bachelor of Arts, and then I did a Master's of Adult Education, and uh, with two little boys, will I add, <laughs> and a part-time job. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> my son still says, how the heck did you do it? I have no idea, <laughs> is my response. Um, so did all of that, finished my Master's in 1999, and um, was working in, an IT, uh, in the IT industry, and that kind of, you know, because of the slump, things, I found a new job, went to this other job, and I met a woman who was selling a loom. And I had been remarried for a few years, and so I was like, um, we're gonna go see his parents. I said, so, I think we'll just do a little detour. I met this person at work, and I, I, I told her I'd drop in and say hi, and whatever, little did you know, I was dropping in to see this loom that was for <laughs> sale. So, uh, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna buy this loom, we're coming, driving back, and I'm literally going, how am I going to tell my husband <laughs> <laughs> that I'm going to buy this loom, and he's probably going to have to go pick it up. <laughs> and uh, we're driving home, and he says, so you're going to buy that loom, and I'm going to go pick it up. And I just went, oh, God, you know me too well. <laughs> so I've been weaving, that was in 2002, so I've been weaving ever since. I've gone through several looms since then. Um, and, uh, and learned a whole lot of new techniques since then as well. Um, my main loom now that I work on is either a 60 inch tapestry loom or a 45 inch uh, eight harness loom. Those are my two basic looms. Um, this piece is mine. This piece is mine. <laughs> um, this was woven on a Jacquard loom in Montreal and for about 10 years uh, I started going to Montreal, to the Montreal Centre for Contemporary Textiles to take um, jacquard weaving with my guru, Louise Lemieux Berube, and um, loved, it, loved it so much that I actually thought of buying a jacquard loom when I retired, you know, because you, you kind of always think about the retirement from the paying job to do the stuff you love. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, and then I looked into it, and Jacquard Loom started at about 50,000 US <laughs> without the setup. <laughs> so um, that wasn't going to work for me. So um, anyway, uh, so I just thought, well, so much for the Jacquard Loom, so much for Jacquard weaving. And um, so I haven't been doing the Jacquard weaving for a little while, but it's if I ever had the chance to go and do it again, I certainly would. Mm -hmm. um, so again, fast forward to uh, today, um, I'm a mom, my, my son <coughs> turned 46, so, oh my god, yes, I was 12 when I had him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he turned 46, I have an eight-year-old granddaughter who is the apple of my eye, and a couple of weeks ago she was at my house and I had a warp on and um, I took her upstairs and I said, so do you want to try weaving? And she was totally right into it. Mm. Oh, be still my heart. So, <laughs> so, uh, so my granddaughter hopefully will follow in my footsteps. Amazing. She's got a lot of yarn and looms to uh, <laughs> <laughs> inherit. <laughs> um, I live on the St. John River and look at a beautiful view of the St. John River every day from my weaving studio and from you know, all over my house which is great. And if somebody had asked me, um, you know, what are you going to do when you retire? If, they, if somebody said, oh, you'll be watching birds, I would have said, you are crazy. <laughs> we, I watch birds. <laughs> In my back hawk and all of the other little birds, too. Mm -hmm. um, and then right now, I'm finishing, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in 20, uh, about two years ago, in 2021, 
I had a piece selected for a public art commission um, with the Arc-en-Ciel School in Ormocto. Mm -hmm. So that's hanging there. Um, and I'm working on a public art piece right now. So uh, fingers crossed, wish, wish me luck. It's very ambitious. Not the weaving. The weaving is actually very small. The project itself is very ambitious. So wish me luck. Mm -hmm. I, the, the deadline was supposed to be the end of February. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> this is on YouTube. Sorry. We're <laughs> <laughs> asking for an extension. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's it for me. I'm sure I've forgotten a whole pile of things, but yeah. That's what happens when you get in front of everybody, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Karen. That was really nice to hear. Um, I'm Tracy Austin, and I made the fashion piece for you can see. And I have been, oh my gosh, sewing since I was I think 18. So I was a late starter with sewing. And I actually um, had to relearn to sew when I went to school at the Brunswick College of Graphic Design, <coughs> which I now work at, and I am the head of fashion there. Um, so fashion was kind of a, uh, I don't know, it's a slippery space. Sometimes I love it and sometimes I hate it. Mm -hmm. But the parts that I love are the craft side of it and the building and the, the customization of it. I hate the fast fashion side of things and the, I know we've all gone to the mall, we try something on and you just feel terrible afterwards because it doesn't look good or it doesn't do what you want. And I wanted to disassemble that and figure out what it is that has changed with fashion and why it has this kind of backloaded kind of feeling to it. Because if I say I'm a textile craft artist, I get a very different response than if I say I'm a fashion artist to most people because of a, a lot of the time we're not educated on what exactly fashion is. So to combat that, I tried a, a bunch of different iterations. I went, okay, I'm not a fashion designer, I'm a costume designer. And then I got mad about that because I was like, oh, I shouldn't have to change the word fashion. I want to take it back kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I did the same thing with craft. Um, where I say craft to people to, you know, cardboard and construction paper and stuff, so I had to take that word back. Um, so I've been kind of throwing down different identities for myself, and then I sort of realized, okay, what's the core issue here? And it was, of course, the fast fashion um, economical issue, the environmental issue, but also the body dysphoria issue that comes from fashion, where people aren't comfortable in what they're wearing. And of course, that is then used by mass market to control how we purchase what we purchase and to keep us purchasing and buying because we're always looking for the new thing. So I didn't want to deal with that. There's many people out there who are making wonderful pieces for everyday people, custom made work. That's all my students are doing. Um, I instead went small because I wanted to make sure that I had a piece that nobody could wear. So nobody had to worry about like, oh, if there was a, a size six piece, somebody might fit into it versus this, nobody's fitting into it. So everyone's on a, on a global <laughs> playing scale. And we were able to just look at fashion and um, textile work as an art and a craft instead of looking at it as who's the model, where are they wearing, what are they doing, what are they looking like. I wanted to make it about the craft itself. Um, and that's what started my, my miniature work in fashion. And I've bounced around a couple times. I was working with dolls for a while, and I got a whole bunch of questions about dolls, which of course was just the model concept all over again. <laughs> so I dropped the, the doll completely and went with the miniature uh, dress forms. And, um, and then this past summer, I found my love for needle felting. So that's the next thing that's going to combine with what I'm working. But uh, my work is always, you know, as you can probably guess, dark and gothic inspired and nature inspired. And um, I'm always playing around with the concept of a light in the dark. There's always this hopeful side to things, even though we're looking in the darkness of things and trying to um, kind of put this mood forward of sultry and mysterious and conceptualized pieces with fashion, but then making sure that we realize you're not always in the dark by yourself and there's always a, a bright side of things. So even though I had to move the miniature fashion to talk about fashion, it's not a bad thing. It's just changing the perspective of how we're looking at things. Um, and basically, I, uh, I graduated from a BCCD in 2007. I'm a proud alumni. And then I was only gone for a couple of years. And then I came back to the school working as a technician, then an instructor, now the head of the studio. And uh, my specialty is pattern drafting and design. And those are my, my focus at the moment with what I do. But it's all about education. And I always tell my students this, that you're going to have to always educate people what your craft is about. Um, and sometimes it's not even about, like everyone always thinks it's this grand like inspiration behind why you're doing things. And sometimes it's just the learning of a technical skill. 
Because what fashion used to be was that you owned like two or three outfits and you took care of them and they lasted forever instead of this constant changing of what we're doing. So my pieces always revolve around environmentalism, feminism, socialism, and uh, playing with that concept of a light and a dark. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm Gabriel Bichot. I'm uh, an actor and a writer. Uh, I come from here in Moncton and grew up in Dieppe. It's important for some people, so I make this <laughs> Um, uh, so uh, basically I've been uh, uh, writing poetry since I was a kid. Uh, my first poetry collection was out in 2011. I have three po uh, poetry collections, La uh, Promenade in 2011, Desanada in 2014. I have also uh, Akadi Road in 2018. Uh, right now I'm uh, growing a beer for a play I'm going to be uh, in, in uh, April. And uh, so I'm more uh, on the actor side for uh, for well for now, and um, actually uh, developing my last play that was out in 2021, which was called Crowbar, uh, in a movie. So I'm doing the translation, I guess, <laughs> from the, the play to the movie. So uh, that's what I've been uh, working on. Thank you. Uh, yes, good morning. My name is uh, Carlos Morales. I am from El Salvador. Uh, I assume I am a poet and a writer. Since uh, in the last couple of years, I've been, I've been writing just a little bit of prose. Okay? But uh, mostly people here uh, know me from my poetry. Uh, I started to write poetry back in El Salvador, my motherland. When I was uh, 22 years old, I don't know for some reason people start writing at that age. Who knows why? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they are living in law or, okay, I don't know why, but that's what the time I started to write poetry. Um, but uh, I write a lot and a lot of bunch of little pieces. And then I, uh, met people who were my uh, classmates uh, at school, and then I show what I have uh, written at that time, and then they, uh, they selected 11 points. And from that time, uh, I, didn't, I didn't stop. So, but it was a very difficult time back in El Salvador, uh, uh, the political situation was uh, not so good. We had a civil war for some time. Uh, you were not allowed to, to, to write your own name in your, in your poetry or, or something that people didn't like. So you either did write your name or you have to use a pen name. And that's what's uh, my situation back there. Okay. And finally, this was in 1989. I, uh, unfortunately, I ended up in jail because of, of, what, I, of what I have written. Okay. And then it took two years to be here in Canada. Okay? We're talking about 30 years of my life living here. Okay? And I thank a lot of people here, especially this uh, wonderful lady from Argentina, Nella Rio, who Sadly passed away last November. Mm -hmm. he, she introduced me to this wonderful place, to this wonderful country, okay? And allowed me to meet a lot of poets in the world of here, okay? Um, and it was uh, until 2012 I finally uh, published my first book of poetry. 
faith. And but since then it's really been nice because uh, I had the chance back in 2018 to participate in um, what you people call the poetry weekend. Yeah. And to my surprise, three of my poets were selected to be part of the torch. Yes, I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about uh, Kayla here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And since then, uh, many people are familiar with I have written. Okay. And, and you could say pandemic was uh, very good to me because I had a chance to contribute to many other to many other uh, places and uh, magazines too. Okay. And here with this project too. And I'm very glad to, to be part of. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So I've got a, a few questions just to get us started. And um, from there, from what I understand, you, some of you might have questions for each other as well. But um, I'm just curious for the poets, uh, how important is, is your language to you, or writing in your language <coughs> to your poetry? And do you feel like anything's ever lost in translation? Well, in my case, I do my own translations. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it still lacks some English background, but I try to do my best. Okay, since there are idioms that are very particular to, to Spanish, so it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to translate them. And even some indigenous word too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here my nice uh, my nice teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, enough of that. Yeah. Yes, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of nice to do that, but I wish I could have the a gift of languages that's in order to speak freely and we don't need to translate. Mm -hmm. But it's always a challenge too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, for me, it's, it's I, I French is my first language, so it's it's. Uh, I, it's not that I don't know how to write in English, but I don't have the same uh, familiarity with the language, mm -hmm. and the same instinct mm -hmm. with the language. Mm -hmm. So there's been a couple of times where uh, I've had to do bilingual works where I've tried to create, but I don't have the same ease mm -hmm. to 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 manipulate the language. And there's also like a, a for me, a, almost like a political statement to do it also in, particularly in a, 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 as someone who, who lives in a, in a minority as, as a Francophone in a, an English uh, majority country, province and everything, mm -hmm. and the roots. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's, you know, it's the language in which I, I, I socialize mostly, in which I love, in which I dream. So, so it's just natural for me to, to, to create in that language. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the the, the first uh, uh, re re reflex. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to tr translating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hopefully that wasn't lost in translation. Yeah. Uh, um, so so when it comes to translation, uh, I've never tried to translate my own my own works, or, or or maybe here from time to time, even just my biography. If I have to su submit a biography, sometimes it's hard for me to translate and just trying to, to put the right words. So I, I, and I like the, the opportunity to have to work with translators because mm -hmm. uh, um, sometimes it even becomes something like a tradaptation. Mm -hmm. So a mix between an adaptation and a translation, which I, I don't know if the word is actually exists, but to me it's as interesting because mm -hmm. it becomes another piece of art. Mm -hmm. it, becomes a it becomes a piece of art in another language, if it's in English, if it's in Spanish, if it's in whatever, other languages because the often somebody who's going to translate poetry mm -hmm. is also a poet yes and by having another poet translating my poems they find the words i can't necessarily imagine in that language mm -hmm. uh, that's going to make the poetry happen mm -hmm. and even if my 
way of uh, uh, using French to do poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in 2011, when I started, I, I went to a, 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 um, a talk like this, but with translators that were just finishing a three days uh, workshop. Mm -hmm. And I heard this, this uh, sentence, uh, an, an author doesn't write in a language, mm -hmm. a specific language. Uh, an author does something specific to a language, mm. and it's by doing that specific thing to a language that he becomes an author, a writer, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to translate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, so with that mindset, mm -hmm. uh, being translated is putting my work or what I've done to my language into the hands of somebody else mm -hmm. that will try to do the same thing to that language with. Mm -hmm what I try to do to my language mm -hmm. and by doing that maybe making something else happen mm -hmm. something else flourish mm -hmm. and to me that's as interesting because my my work stays alive yeah. that way uh, it's like when you get a, a book out or, or you, you share something you wrote uh, it's not yours anymore mm -hmm. it's what what if some what's one going to do with how they perceive it, how they read it, how they read it out loud, how they read it from the paper, uh, with their, all the baggage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not mine. Mm -hmm. It's whatever, whatever whoever is going to take it and do whether that person wants to do with it. And sometimes, you know, you're, you're your intention won't be necessarily the same as, yeah. the, as, it, as it is perceived. And it's part of the, the, the responsibility you, you, you have as a writer or uh, as someone who creates, mm -hmm. but also uh, 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 the, 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 the freedom you have. Yeah. Uh, at first, that's, you know, that you have to, with great freedom comes great responsibility. <laughs> 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 uh, as Uncle well, Ben yeah, says it in Spider-Man, yeah. Spider yeah. I mean, <laughs> but, 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 but to me it's... I guess those that, two yeah. mindset. You don't you don't write in language. You do something specific, and this freedom you have comes with great responsibilities. And then just leave it there, and hopefully yeah. uh, you're gonna be uh, yeah. it's gonna live uh, from yeah. its I'll life. Just a moment. I think that's the perfect segue into thinking about um, the process that you all went through together, because um, this like having to let go of what you did exactly <laughs> <laughs> and trusting someone to run with it. Um, was what we really asked of all of the artists and poet duos. And, uh, sorry everybody, my three-year-old's in the audience. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this is a confusing scenario for him. Um, I was just wondering if we could, maybe both duos could reflect on that. So perhaps starting with Karen and Carlos. <laughs> Oh, no, it's fine. Oh, good. I, ha I have a two years old at home. Yeah. He's been doing great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, starting with Karen and Carlos. Um, okay. How did you work together? What was it like? And was it scary for you to sort of give over your artwork in that way? It was different for me. We were kind of talking about that on the way up because we drove up together and mm -hmm. uh, from Fredericton. And, um, and so. I guess I didn't know how somebody else would interpret a piece that, you know, like it's it's got family, in it, like yeah. it's and it's. I didn't know how somebody else would interpret yeah. that, and because to me, I've got my story behind it, yeah. but I didn't know what Carlos was going to interpret yeah. and how he was going to feel about that and how that was going to come out in words, yeah, right. So. Yes. Yes, uh, I was telling her that this is not the first time I, I do this kind of uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, this one seems quite similar. But uh, you can call it a technique. I will have to write a poem. It was a workshop, so the only show was a big painting. Okay, so write a point about this. Okay, 
So, but you didn't know who paid, mm -hmm. who did that. What's, what was the story, the story behind that? So you always had to work with what you had, you probably your eyes, okay? But this time was really quite different because, uh, well, it reminds me home, actually. Mm -hmm. Home, when I, when I went on vacation with my family in France, and it also really were fun times. Okay, and then, then I thought, these people are also part of my, of my life too, mm -hmm. okay? They are human beings like me, so we share the same, the same story, the same life too. So it's, it's like I always know these people from the very beginning, so I, you could, uh, Read in my poem something about that too. Okay? So, and I, when I was at Karen's place, I was uh, asking her a lot of questions <laughs> about, about, uh, about her family, okay? about her life too. And that uh, helped, me, helped me a lot because this time was more personal mm -hmm. than ever. Okay, because when you write poetry, you not only write about uh, all the all the people experiences, but your own experience too. Okay, so and so in that way, you are part of a bigger bigger community. Okay, and that's what I know about in this project. Thank you. Well, I think Carla said a great word when he said community, because that's what I felt like this whole experience was about. Um, my piece is made up of over 250 petals, and I invited over, I think I invited about 50 artists to join me. We got over 25, I believe. And um, for every petal that other artists created, I made one to match. Not so much that it matched theirs, but just one per one kind of thing. Um, and mine was all women artists when I, uh, when I put this piece out, talking about the contribution of women artists to um, New Brunswick art scenes, specifically in Fredericton, but it was all across uh, um, New Brunswick and then those who had, had been here previously and things like that. So when I did that, I didn't explain to Gabriel what it was about, and it was about community and different perspectives and all of us coming together. And I think that's basically what we talked about the first time we had our conversation. Mm -hmm. it was. It was one of those, it's a melting pot of all these things coming together. And um, and then I just trusted you to go with it because you seemed to have an idea right off the bat what you wanted to do. Of course, we were all playing tag because it, uh, it was a busy time for everybody. It was like <laughs> COVID. It was just, everything was just crazy. But um, it was nice because this is one of my favorite parts is to just put my idea out there. I have a reason for why I did it and I want to see how people respond. So I was really excited about the poetry side of this. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll see how you're yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, having the conversation with you was uh, very enlightening for me. Uh, having to to, to, to to understand like the, the, the process before, and, and learning about how uh, uh, you you had asked those uh, those women all, all over the, the, the province to to contribute with petals. So how how can I translate that in poetry? And how can I do that as a, 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 a man, a gosse c'est genre hétéro, sorry. But doing that uh, as being part of the, the, the majority in, in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, being a feminist, not wanting to take, uh, uh, to, to, to speak about or for women for them, you know, just. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I thought, well, the, the, the community part uh, really uh, resonated, and with the, 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 the theme, planting vernacular, I was always thinking about the language and, and being able to write and being able to write with that language, a minority language here, was a, a way for me uh, uh, to try to gather uh, uh, and, 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 and to, to go and, and search for all the kinds of ways that this language is spoken all over 
uh, uh, all over the place is here in the Atlantic provinces. So to me, the poem, the, the, the tradaptation, I guess, <laughs> uh, of the work, uh, being able to gather those expressions, those ways, uh, uh, hearing the language and speaking the language that I've heard, uh, uh, was the, the best way to try to, uh, uh, to express what I've received, what I've perceived, like when, what, what you told me your, your piece was about. So, uh, um, so the work was, uh, the work with the poetry was, well, well, yeah, that was the inspiration. And I, I was thinking of that, and then when you, you, you told me about it, I was just like, yeah, it matches, it works, it's like a, a, a way in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. Um, so, Karen, I think you had a question oh. that you had prepared. I'll turn it over to you folks. <laughs> I've got, I've got oh, more oh, if you turn. want more, but. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Well, actually, Tr- Tracy, I did have a question because you asked me a question when we were meeting on the phone. I was like, I've got to get back in a <laughs> So, uh, so, um, so, what was the process? And I know you talked about that, but your timeline—I was interested in finding out about your timeline from when you started to reach out to artists and getting the pieces, you know, sort of in. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you met with them because, of course, COVID and all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, and then, did you have help putting the pieces together? Mm-hmm. And, uh, or did you have a plan on where each petal would be placed sort of a thing? Mm-hmm. And then talking about the fabrics used for the piece and, uh, and then what are the bodies in the skirt part? Um, made out of and talking about that and like <laughs> 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 there's a lot of questions packed in here. Yeah, okay. So um, yeah, just start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this piece was about a year and a half. Um, it was the final piece to my previous series called Weight of Power, which talked about um, what you put forward into the world will cost something. Um, so I was doing all this talk about what it costs to be a woman and what it costs to put yourself out there, and I said, okay, I kind of have to put. Um, my 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 work where my mouth is. I can't just talk about it. So instead, I said, okay, let's just not just talk about what other women are doing. Let's actually bring women into it. And um, so when I started doing that, I have a wonderful um, connection of fashion artists, of course, with my position at the school. So I first reached out to all the alumni that I had there that were were a female identifying. And then I went down and talked to the textile head, um, Rachel McGilvery, downstairs, and she gave me another list of textile artists to talk to. And then I kind of wanted to bring in some wild cards, so I talked to a couple of metalsmiths who joined me, and um, I had a couple artists that were just multimedia artists as well. So I sent in a lot of invites, and a lot of people um, were really excited to do it because it was a smaller investment for them. And what I asked was, um, I gave them a sketch of what I proposed the idea would look like. It was more so line work at that point. I gave a, a suggested color palette, but told people you could do whatever you want because the pebbles were about the people. It wasn't about, it wasn't my choice. I had to kind of get over that, that ego part of myself and let myself realize that I had to take anything and everything that came in. So if it came in, it's on the dress. Mm-hmm. There's no question, I didn't skip any of them. And from that point, um, I gave people a deadline, which I padded, knowing that we would miss it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all know artists and guys people, so I knew we'd miss it. I had a few people that were right on top of it. Actually, Lee, you were right on top of it. Uh, and a couple of my coworkers who were right next to me were like, I can't be late, she's right there. But then we had a lot of people, and then of course we had to deal with the mail and things like that. And it was, in, it was great. Right when COVID was starting, so of course the mail service was a mess, and we we're back in the world. Anyway, they all got to me. We got none lost in the mail, so that was a yay. Um, but yeah, I didn't have a big plan for how I was going to lay them out because I didn't know what I was going to get. So it was, was kind of one of those things of, well, I guess we'll see what we get, and I'll have to just kind of figure out the curation of it once I get all the pieces in. And I did ask that people worked, if possible, as natural as possible for their for fabrics, but I wasn't going to put a limit on that. And I would say about 90% of them are natural fabrics, so we're looking at linens, wools, silks, uh, cottons, things like that. And that was just part of my always um, environmental initiative that's going on with things here. But um, I really enjoyed it because people got to create something that they didn't have to be crazy tied to, especially since they had to give it to me. So I'm asking them to create something and then just, you know, just hand it over. It's no big deal. <laughs> um, so I was excited to have those come in. And then it's kind of like once I had it in, I used a cotton base and um, a silk. Silk's everywhere else, all over the piece. And um, I did the bodice so that it had as many colors as possible through it. So it's, it's still black, but it's got metallic threads running through and beads and things. So that it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, 
fight against the skirt, which is the major part of this piece. And uh, yeah, we wait for the pieces to come in. And once I had everyone's names checked off and I had all of the petals and every set of petals I got in, I took a picture of them with the ones I made to match. So I, need, I still need to edit those. I need to talk for like four years later. But, um, <laughs> I need to edit them down. But I have um, an ongoing journal of how all the pieces went together. And um, then I just started placing them. I had to be um, conscious of color and theme, but also weights. Mm -hmm. There's some pieces that are metal in there. There's some pieces that are quite thick because they're wool. So I wanted it to lay nicely, but then make sure that I could do those highlights and pop everything out. So if there's a certain color here, I want to make sure I balance the color elsewhere in the piece and all that. So it was. Uh, it went together very quickly. I put the whole thing together myself, um, which is I think the least I could do after I had people <laughs> give me half the petals. But uh, yeah, I think that, that pulled it all. Did I miss any of the questions? No, I don't I think, think so. Them all? <laughs> yeah. Ah, <laughs> right. okay, yes. So just before we um, switch over to Q and A, uh, I was remiss. I forgot to ask our poets to do their recitations at the beginning <laughs> yes. of our panel. So if you wouldn't mind no, now, no, no. okay, no, we're, we're, no, we're going to no, have a nice no, live no, uh, poetry no. reading. So. You're sure they have to stand up. Yeah, you sh yeah, that's fine. The camera will follow you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you. So I'm going to read a bullet. Okay. The original in Spanish and the translation. Okay. Qué triste lo sé, Mar. Y cómo comparte el cielo su tristeza. Y también lloro con la parte grande, donde he aprendido a amar otra vez. Parte querida de mi corazón que todavía funciona con las vibras que tomo. Barcos flotan sobre las aguas. Son los espíritus de Dios y han tomado el rojo, pero no aquel de la muerte que nos acaricia en nuestras últimas horas, sino de la lucha que nos espera desde que nacemos para cumplir con el deber como buenos soldados. En el cielo veo los ancestros que no conocía, hechos a mi imagen y semejanza, siempre alegres, siempre dispuestos a la aventura, dominando a las criaturas del mar. Solo falta que Ulises se las sube. Por favor. Déjenme estar con ustedes. Y así volveré a vivir. Now the translation. How sad the sea sinks. And how the heavens share the sorrow. I also mourn my homeland where I meant to look again, the morsel of my heart that still beats with the cuts of a cousin. Ships drift on the water, the spirit of God, and they have adopted the red, but not the red of death, but crockets in our final hours, the right of the part that awaits us to do our duty as good soldiers from death. In the sky, I see unknown ancestors, fashioned from my image and likeness forever content, forever ready for adventure, relating the sea creatures, only Ulysses is missing. Please, 
let me join you all. So, what do you insist? What's it? Gracias. qui tourne cette fois dans tes tripes et cette fois encore sans jamais figer. Le mode d'emploi pour wirer les mouches à feu, de registre en niveau qui guette que guetter c'est pas jeter puis que de jeter ne jettera rien à la morgue. Tant l'oreille quand ça change, comme le goût de la vague, les sons du chino, jusqu'on sent sans sentir la chaleur des réunions, des pétales mis ensemble pour qu'on se revête de ce qui vit au-delà des mots. Okay, um, thanks everybody. So, if there are any questions from the audience, we'd be happy to take those at this point. Or comments? Brian? Go ahead. Could you just repeat what you said about uh, how you look at writing poetry, like you using the language? You, I forget what you said, but it was really cool. I liked it. Oh, the, 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 the quote? I yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so uh, really uh, a, a writer doesn't write in a specific language. A writer does something specific to language, mm -hmm. and by that becomes a, not, a writer or, or an author, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's just a, 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 it's a posture, I guess, uh, a mindset. So I'm not writing in French. I'm doing something to French. And by doing something to French, I become a writer. Mm -hmm. and that, yeah, that's really interesting for thinking about the correlation between poetry and material practice. Yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. the words are the material. Absolutely. Just like, yeah. you know, you're not going to, you don't make clay. Right. You do yeah. make clay, but like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you don't like make clay, but you have to work with it. You make something happen with clay. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Or textiles. Or, or textiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. to, to, me, to me, well, it became, or, or it was a, When I heard the quote, it, it, it became a mindset. So, so it's my it's my crafting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, even like in this poem, when you hear uh, uh, words in English, uh, um, or to me it's in French. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know the word right. comes from English, but it's used in a French sentence with a French syntax, mm -hmm. and the people who is gonna use those sentences or those words in that specific sense are people who are firstborn French, mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. So even by, uh, 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 it's, it's even a true adaptation of a language. Uh, uh, and to me, like what makes a language alive is the way that language is spoken or written mm -hmm. with all the influences all over the, wor the world. Mm -hmm. So, so trying to do a landscape, I guess, of those ways of speaking the language. And that poem was a, uh, a way to, and the, 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 there's a little blink at the end, uh, petal, petal, so, so, so to, uh, I'm not sure how I wrote it, but to, to, to dress yourself, the, the, the petals that, what, what lives uh, beyond words. Mm -hmm. So, so to me what, you know, was the, 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 the way of tradating the community <laughs> part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. I, um, I remember initially when I sent out the pieces of work to you, it was just images, right? You never got to see the work in person. And I sent out around 30 to 35 pieces. So f to both of you, what was it specifically about this piece that drew you in that you wanted to work on this one specifically? Okay. To both of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both the poets. <laughs> Well, when I uh, first saw Karen's uh, piece, so it, uh, yeah, as I told you before, it reminds me home. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, 
been, some people have told me that all my uh, immigrant experience, it's uh, becoming part of my poetry and of what I am. Okay, it's a uh, really kind of difficult not to think about, not to think about that after all these years. Okay, I still feel some, uh, sometimes like I, like I am a foreigner living in, in Canada, but at the same time, I am a Canadian, <laughs> a Canadian from another country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's what I, I like about this particular piece, okay? Because uh, for me, it has a lot of history. Okay? Not only not only personal history, but also community. Mm -hmm. okay, because we all are of a community of different communities. Okay, and that's what I, I express in my poem. When I, when I talk about these people, fashion in my innocent likeness. Okay, these are human beings too. Okay, it doesn't matter if, if they speak English or they speak Spanish or, or they're white or they're Hispanic. Okay. These are people that share somehow their lives. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of uh, somebody told me it was a sea is a no man's land. Mm -hmm. And hearing what you say it reminds me of that quote. Um, I don't I don't remember what what I remember is being matched with your piece. Yeah. I don't remember choosing. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it was because I was late. And <laughs> <laughs> might be. Might. Might have happened. I guess you were traveling at that time. I. Yeah. I was probably. Anyways, I'm. I'm not sure, but uh, uh, I, I. I think I was matched, and, and, and I remember when when I saw the piece, I was. I was looking for an angle, and I was thinking, well, you know what? With all the concept, I, we we need to talk first. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, one thing that was important for me was uh, was the the the, um, the bet of adaptation. <laughs> I know I'm re <laughs> repeating myself, but 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 you know thinking you know the 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 theme and planting vernacular, but see, seeing also like what's what am I going to be told and how is that going to resonate? Because to me it was important to try to put that into words. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and as the conversation went on, it confirmed some things, the portrait, the, the variations, that's, you know, that's one part I, I, I sat first in the, in the piece. Um, and then the, 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 the carte, well, not necessarily carte blanche, but the, 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 con the, the contents I felt also like, you, you do you and let's see what happens. And, mm -hmm. And then you know have the, that exchange. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah sure, go go go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Do do do, do your thing. Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I mean one of the sort of like part of the thesis of the exhibition was thinking about is there is there a, an Atlantic vernacular? Is there a regional voice? And what does it sound like? <laughs> what does it smell like? What does it feel like? All those things. Um, if so. And I think uh, part of the premise as well is like, it doesn't sound only like lobsters and lighthouses. <laughs> like the, there are these sort of characters that come to stand in for um, a regional identity here that, you know, might resonate with some people, but I would think even fishers are like, well, I fish, but I don't wear the yellow hat. <laughs> um, so certainly, you know, that is a part of part of the regional identity, but it doesn't encompass all of it, and it doesn't encompass the richness. And so um, when I got to curate this, I was just like, okay, I want, we want to see the diversity that is this place. We want to see the cultural richness that is this place. We want to see the diversity of contemporary practice and, and poetry. 
And I think um, when you're in sort of a, a, an area with like a smaller population, an even smaller population of artists of various kinds, getting to come together and collaborate um, just creates something new and we can feel so siloed and, and so I really wanted to see what would happen when we kind of get out of those silos. So um, I guess I'm curious too for the artists and if anyone from the audience wants to chime in that who participated, that's certainly welcome. But um, how was that for you? I mean, it was at a time of isolation as well because of the pandemic. So mm -hmm. um, did it help with that? <laughs> like, how do you feel about the idea of Atlantic vernacular or voice? And um, do you think we, did we succeed at all in kind of trying to capture that? Is it capturable? I guess I'm curious. I'm left with just as many questions as I began with. <laughs> Um, I think it really shows a emphasis on voice. So when I say voice, I mean in whatever medium you, you want to look at. Um, so our, our, our pieces of physically are saying something, we're telling stories, but then we're letting that open and see how other artists are responding to it. And we just happen to have two poetry artists who aren't English first language, which is great. So we have layers that are happening. And in the end, it doesn't matter. It's great to see how everyone interpretates it. and. Um, I think that mixing pot of language and physical things, which I mean, art is a language as well, right? So there's all these languages coming together, both verbal and physical, and um, it's a really nice experience to see those join together, because I think that might be what explains our community, is that this giant mixing pot of, um, even within our own country, but then on top of it, the different personas and different types of people coming together to create this body of work that is an art piece itself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess we're just about out of time. Any last thoughts? Uh, yes. I'd be interested hearing from the artists. So you have poets see your word, react, generates an emotion, and create something. So after reading their work of art, what type of emotions did you get in return? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I know that Carlos really wrote from the heart. And and I know, like, I, I, I guess because, you know, this is like my family's at the top there. And um, boating, so my dad came from Bathurst and uh, Yahal, really. <laughs> this pit director wasn't taken in Yahal, but to me, Yahal and the Bay of Schiller was always like about boats. So in the summertime, going and, and seeing the boats. So I know when Carlos said that this spoke to him and reminded him of his family and of his homeland, that, you know, that, like I, it put a new perspective on it for me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about my family anymore. Okay. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So, anyway. Um, I was really excited for small. <laughs> 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 like, oh, poet, no, like, I, I think critique and curation is a, a huge part of being an artist. So in this case, um, it was like almost like a, a really official kind of version. I was like, okay, he's going to say something. I'm really excited to see what's going to be. And we had a, a conversation about what the piece was about, but there was a lot of interpretation around that. So I was excited to see his interpretation of it, especially uh, going back to the part where we talked about like choose and pieces. I think the first thing I asked was, oh, no, how, why did you pick my piece? And you're like, well. <laughs> and, and I asked that question because my, my piece was so revolving around women yes. that I wanted to see what he would have to say about it. Because it wasn't so much that it was only, it was about women, but it wasn't for women. It was for everybody. Yeah. So I was really excited to see what that would be. And as soon as it went up in the woods, I was like, well, hit the sound clips and all that. Was, this is such a cool experience because you're seeing somebody respond specifically to your own art. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's exciting, I guess. <laughs> yes, yeah. Okay, so I guess we'll bring everything to a close. Thank you all so much for being on the panel today. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic having you. Oh, thank you. So lovely to hear more of your you. own stories. And um, yeah, I guess this is, this is our last official event, which is yeah, it's a little sad. This has been a part of our lives since uh, my three-year-old was still in my belly. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a pleasure, um, definitely, to work on this project. So thank you all for joining us today. Thanks again to uh, Craft of Ali, Fatima, the team. Um, 
whose names I'm forgetting right now, but that's why I'm doing it first. Okay. <laughs> um, and Nandi, of course, for our fantastic uh, YouTube streaming, which has been really a, a key piece to helping um, disseminate this project. So thank you everyone who participated.